Dell friends, welcome to another episode of Talk with Renee Dallow. It is me, your host, Renee Dallow. And this week, I am joined by the very fabulous Diana Greschuk. Did I say it right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Longtime listeners of my show know that I um, am particularly prickly about the pronunciation of people's names because my name is often mispronounced, which is why I named the show my name so that maybe people would get it and they still don't always get it. So I'm glad that I got it right on the first try. We don't have to re-edit. <laughs> Diana, is next. I love it. Diana is here from fam, Fan Your Flame. And tell us what Fan Your Flame is, friend. Sure, Renee. So Fan Your Flame is a company that I founded that is really rooted in financial literacy. Mm -hmm. I've been a CPA for almost 20 years. I've been in the professional services, finance, and accounting industry for over 20 years. And I've also recently obtained mindset coaching and emotional intelligence certification. So what I do is I blend my practical CPA vibes with my mindset and emotional intelligence vibes and do financial coaching for folks rooted in practical financial concepts and things that you would find in the coaching world, empowering beliefs, um, all those sorts of things. I love it. You and I are a bit of a twin flame in that my background, you know, I'm in the wedding industry. And then I also got certified as a life coach to sort of get more of the emotional, you know, emotional IQ mindset pieces in place. Because I really, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur for over 10 years now, and so much of this work is, is mental. And I, didn't really know that when I started. If, it, if someone had told me when I began this journey, ha, most of this work's going to be mental, but I've been like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> no, I'm okay. I don't need that. But then you find yourself down this journey and you're like, oh yeah, my mindset really is the thing that's in the way. Yeah. And a lot of people don't ever see that with money. With money, it's very by the book. The money is what the money is. Mm -hmm. But when it's not about the money, it's about your relationship with money. That's a game changer. When you start looking at that, that is when things will shift for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I know like we've talked about uh, money mindset on the show a fair amount, you know, and I've revealed over the years of the show that like, I didn't grow up knowing anything about money. Like my parents taught me zero things about money. I didn't even have an allowance. So I have spent most of my adult life relearning and teaching myself what I need to know to be successful and reframing the mindset for myself so much so that now I absolutely see it in other people, right? When I'm taught, when I'm coaching someone or even having a casual conversation with someone I just meet and they come at me with some sentence, right? Some combination of words and my spidey sense goes like, Doo -doo -doo. oh, you have money mindset problems or like that's a, oh, that's a mindset thing or that's a limiting thought, right? And does that happen to you uh, probably daily, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think especially in the finance world and when it comes to money, I think a lot of folks don't realize it's an inside job. I think for a lot of people, they look to money for things like safety and security, but that's an inside job. You have to be safe and secure and money is only a tool and it can only get you so far on those things. Oh, that's really true. So, okay. One of the things that I've heard you say, because I've, I've had the honor of seeing you speak, uh, is there's nothing more powerful than a financially literate female entrepreneur. Yeah. Tell me about that. Oh man. So I think that is something when you run into a lot of female entrepreneurs out there who start their own businesses, they usually start a business in wedding planning or being a CPA or in their wheelhouse with their specific skill set. And sometimes, oftentimes that has nothing to do with money. You know, a lot of folks out there might have a catering business or run an elementary school or whatever it is that their business is, and they tend not to know about money. And then they start into this thought loop of disempowering beliefs that, oh, I'm not good with money. I need to find someone who's good with money to help me out because I'm not good at it myself. And so the second you divorce yourself from your business finances is the second you give your power away. And what I really love is for women to take that power back, to be able to 
fluently speak the language of finance enough to sound educated to answer questions from investors, vendors, customers, clients, and speak in a way about their business where it shows that they know their balance sheet, they know their income statement, and they know the story that got them to what that financial picture looks like. And when you know where you are, when you know what your current financial situation is, then you can start to think about where you want to go. I want to be able to take annual vacations. I want to exit and sell my business in five years. I want to seek funding and get an investor and really grow my business. All of those are goals. So once you know point A, you can start to think about point B and reverse engineer how you're going to get there. And that is the power because planning as a CEO is really about you nursing that baby, your business into whatever the next phase of its life is and through this existing phase. I'm so glad you mentioned the next phase because I I know in the wedding industry, it's not something we talk about a lot, right? Because a lot of wedding pros don't really have an exit strategy, right? Photographers are going to shoot weddings until their body can't do it anymore, right? And caterers are probably going to work until either they sell their business or someone or like in a generational business, someone else takes over. We don't really talk a lot about exit strategy and what that looks like. And so I'm glad you brought that up as far as like a five-year plan, um, because that's something I've been thinking about just in what my next, you know, era is to, to borrow Taylor Swift's word of the year, you know? Yeah. yeah. And for a lot of people, the asset to sell, if you were to exit your business is the brand, it's yeah. the customer contracts. Yeah. It's whatever IP you've generated in learning and living your lived experience in your business. Yeah. And all of that come together to this thing that would take a lot of resources and time and knowledge for somebody else, a competitor to recreate. So you really do have something there. So realizing you are the asset, mm -hmm. you're creating another asset with your business, and then you sell that asset you've created because you built it. I like to quote Lilo and Stitch in, in the Russian accent accent i i designed him for to be unstoppable you know like you create a legal entity to continue past yourself so yeah. when you want to exit the whole point is to sell that legal entity or those assets in it like ip customer contracts brand reputation yes. to somebody coming in so they've got a head start on something they don't have to recreate that has value it totally, I mean, I think back to my first year and like, yeah, so much value in not starting from square one, right? Um, I want to talk since you, you you know, you said the, what if someone's looking to sell what they're selling is, you know, what they've created. What do you think about like the inner work that we have to do to then become financially successful? Like, what do you teach people on that journey? Uh, first of all, you are the asset. So you need to be invested in. Yeah. You need to invest in a coach that is going to get you to where you want to be, a yeah. strategist, whatever it is they, that you need help with. You also need to look at yourself as I am someone worthy of being invested in. Mm -hmm. I need to know my skill. I need to be better so I can command a higher salary or higher prices because I am more experienced. So I'll give you a great example. Being a CPA carries with it a, a credential, a reputation of a certain degree, and that could earn me money versus not having it. So I needed to invest in myself to become a CPA to get that clout that then allows me to earn more money. Mm -hmm. Love it. I feel the same way about my life coach certification because you don't need a certification to be a life coach, although you do as a CPA. And so a lot of people were asking me when I was, it took three years, they were like, why are you doing this? And I said, well, one, I just, I like learning, but two, I think there's some, something to be said about someone who is willing to invest in themselves. And I love what you said. Like you have to get to the point where you are someone who is willing to invest in themselves financially with their time, with their energy, with their mindset. I think so many of us, myself included earlier in my, in my business sort of ran around putting out fires. Um, instead of really intentionally saying, I'm going to invest now in my future self. And I think so many people that happens to in life after college, who develops themselves after college? Like you're like raring to go get out of college, get me out of here. I'm ready to go make money Yeah, and you don't want to be held back. Yeah. That's how you look at self-development when you're younger. That's how I did. Yeah, And I was like, who the hell needs a life coach? It's my life. I'm fine. And then come to find out 
when life happens to you and you turn 40 and you're like, oh crap. Yeah. I really let it get to here. And I did that without a life coach. I should probably figure some stuff out about myself. Yes. I mean, this goes back to something I say. Yeah, we stop investing. Yeah. That like, I think the real work of entrepreneurship is really knowing yourself deeply and like scarily, you know, all the messy parts too, you know. And if you want to set up a business that can withstand any economic environment, it needs to be agile. It needs to be fluid. And so to create a business that is agile and fluid, I have found you yourself have to be agile and yeah. fluid, yeah. which means you need to be changing. You need to be developing all of that. Yeah. What do you think about as we like age and age in our business, right? Um, the idea of like, what success means for you now versus what it meant for you at the beginning. And like, how does that impact our financial success? Oh shit, man. This is the question. This is the $64 million question because how each one of us defines success is how we live our life. Like when I was in college, success was having my own apartment, being able to pay my own bills, yeah. being able to buy dinner for folks, you know, whatever. And then you go into business and success is that title, a promotion, a certain salary, yeah. what other people think of you. And now that I'm in my 40s, success is have I spent the number of hours in the day that I want to spend feeling the way that I want to feel? So if I, you know, I chose for my way that I want to feel, I want to feel passionate. I want to feel grateful. I want to feel limitless. And so if I find myself in hours of the day sitting outside of those feelings, I need to do something to shift myself back into them because that is how I am successful. Yeah. I just want people to hear that. <laughs> I just want people to hear that. Right. Um, I think 100% agree. My words would be slightly different, I think, but I do find myself as I'm... What would your words be? Oh, God, my words would be free. I want to feel like I'm free to do... I'm a bit of a rebel in that I don't want to do whatever I don't want to do at any given mo moment in time. It's amazing that I even stick to a schedule. I don't want to do anything when I... You know what I mean? Like, I'm very um, only child in that way, right? And I'm also like, I'm my own boss. Who's going to tell me? Um, not that I'm not disciplined, but I do sort of want that feeling of like, well, if I wanted to get in the car and drive to the beach today, I could. That's the kind of freedom I mean. Um, and then I also want. Yeah. So I think your free and my limitless are, are yeah. equated right there. Yeah. yeah. I also the word like lux came up, but I mean uh, ease. Right. Like I am someone who I will pay for the upgrade if it makes my experience better, if it makes it easier, if it's more pleasant, I will pay for comfort. <laughs> But I think that just has to be it was my, because I'm, you know, past 45. Um, but that is important to me. Like, that's what money means to me is like comfort, ease, not having to wait online. If I, you know what I mean? Like all those little silly things. But but I remember back when I couldn't afford any of those things and how much kind of that would impact the day in a negative way. Just having to, again, go back to doing things I don't want to do. And then my third word would just, I think, be choice. Right. Like, I just want to be able to choose what I want to do. When I was an actor, when I made money, it was great money, but I never had any control over what I got chosen for. And one of the beautiful things about being an entrepreneur is that I get to choose what I do with my time and I get to choose what projects or clients I take on. And so that has been a lovely sort of shift in my life going from waiting to be chosen. That's a whole, that's the whole life of an actor to being able to choose. And when you think about all the hours in your day, however many hours you're spending inside of feeling free, having choice, and experiencing ease, it's a successful day if you spent all 24 hours in those feelings. And so then it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks success should look like. Right. Yeah. And I often wonder too, you know, in, in the online world, in the last couple of years, pre-pandemic and now especially post, there's so many people out there yelling about their income, right? They're like, I had, I made six figures. I made seven figures. And everyone, like some people are posting like income reports and really opening the door on their finances. And I, I get it if that's what's valuable to them. But I also think that we're, we're missing the point in a way, right? Like who cares if you've brought in seven figures, if you're not living up to those, to whatever your three words are, 
Or who cares if you're bringing in seven figures if you don't get to keep it? Yeah. And for me, a lot of what I do is rooted even deeper in impact Mm -hmm. and how I want to change the world and the legacy that I want to leave behind. And so it doesn't matter how much money I make in my business. My business is about financial literacy and education because there are no high school or college curricula that currently teach personal finance to people in a meaningful way to elevate them out of their current situation, unless you major in finance and accounting in college and go into that as a profession. But we're not equipped with that. So for me, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's about impact to change people's lives and empower them to learn for themselves, supplement their education and learn how to fish. I don't, I don't want to teach someone by giving them a fish here, here's money. No, like I want to teach you how to make money, how to talk about money. And that is impact. That is how you change someone's life. Yes. I also can't believe that they're not teaching personal finance in high school. I mean, it's been a million years since I was in high school, but like it's, that blows my mind that they don't teach it. Still, they don't teach it. And it used to be as like, here's how to write a check. We don't even write checks anymore. Here's how to reconcile a checkbook. No one uses that. It's all online right now. Yeah. What they teach people to do is how to spend money because that's, that's the control. This is where I get into the patriarchy. Yeah. That's the control they have over society is yeah. you're a consumer. And by that, they try to give you the illusion of power that as a consumer, the only thing that matters is what you spend. It is not about what you spend. That is not what is going to elevate you out of their rat race. I saw a TikTok last night that I saved knowing that I was going to talk to you today. That it was a young girl. She probably was a freshman in college speaking on a podcast. And I think she was speaking in sort of like this was a recent thing that had happened to her when she got to college. Of course, she got hit up to get a credit card and she got one and she didn't understand the difference between her credit line and her credit debt. She thought that her credit line was what she was supposed to spend in order to keep the card. So they gave her like $4,000 of credit and she spent, she was like putting, you know, dinners out with her friends on her card because she didn't understand the difference because no one in her family or her life had ever taught her about credit. So, and her mom said, I got this bill in the mail. You got a credit card. She's like, I know. And I spent all 4,000 already. And her mom was like, wait, what? And had to explain to her too late that now she was $4,000 in debt in her like first two months of college. And I watched it. And as my 47 year old self, I was like, Oh honey. And then I thought I probably had the same thought when I went to college. I mean, I definitely got hit up for that immediate college credit card and got one. Cause I was like, well, I got to get utilities turned on. I got to, you know, and I think I remember at the time thinking like, I don't know what to do with this really. (laughs) Yeah. And it matters because things like that can then have a damaging effect to your credit and surprise. People then use your credit history to do background checks on you when you get a job. Right. They do that when you try to rent an apartment, when you try to get a mortgage, when you try to get another credit card. They use credit history for so much and they don't teach you what it's for or that they do or how you can even repair it. Right. Right. And then you learn as you get older. At this point, it's, it's. It's a crime. It is a crime. It's like credit score is like BMI. I think they're both fake. <laughs> I mean, they're real, but they've, it's a construct that was given to us. That's bullshit. Basically. That's a whole other podcast episode. Um, I want to talk to you about the concept of getting financially naked. Cause I know that that is big in your world. Tell me what it means. So whenever you get naked by yourself or with someone, you're getting brutally honest. You're taking off your armor. You're getting real with yourself. So when I say get financially naked, I mean it in the terms of when you're having a money date, when you are figuring out where you stand, when you're figuring out your balance sheet, your income statement, where you are right now, get really real with yourself. Like a lot of people don't have in one place a personal financial statement that shows them all their assets, all their liabilities. So everything they own, everything they owe where their money is coming from and where they're spending it. And I think a lot of people have ignorance for that. They don't want to know. They don't want to deal with the repercussions. Right. When you see it all in one place, it paints a picture. And sometimes that isn't a pretty picture. And you're lying to yourself 
if you're not looking at what the real picture is, because for a lot of people, that picture isn't pretty. Yeah. So getting financially naked is about getting really honest with yourself about your behaviors, what you're doing. Are you, every time you're getting upset, going on Amazon and ordering something and taking that dopamine hit to feel better, but you have a terrible credit score and massive amounts of credit card debt because of it. And right. I'm using this as an example, but I know it's real out there. Oh, it's real. We, we have emotions around money. We have thoughts about money and it creates this relationship with money where then we start behaving a certain way. You know, we're thinking about money. We feel a certain way. We're behaving a certain way with it. And then it creates this reality that we're in. Well, and then I also think the negativity toward the money creates a block. And so then yeah. you're not allowing more money to find you. I know that sounds, people listening are probably like, she's lost her mind, but that is really what I believe. Um, in fact, we did a Better Money Month when you were our guest in my membership Better uh, last month. And one of our members sort of said off the cuff, she was like, you know, every time I clean out my wallet, I book a new client. And I was like, is that true? She's a photographer. And she was like, yeah, a hundred percent. And she's a busy mom of two toddlers. Like she's not cleaning out her wallet every week, y'all. But she's like, every time it gets to the point where I'm like, oh, this wallet's a disaster. She's like, I clean it out. I, you know, just that energetic cleaning. She's like, I book a client. I'm like, okay. But then also the money. I think of it like an energetic parking space. Like what? it's an energetic parking space. If there is someone like a client in that parking space right now, and you don't love working with that client or they're not paying you or whatever, the second you clear that out, you're emptying the parking space for someone better to come along and yep. take that parking space. So yes, out with the old to allow the new to come in. I'm pretty sure that's how the laws of abundance work or whatever. It's true. <laughs> I also think, you know, with this concept of the money date that, that you teach, right? I would also offer people listening who, if that feels scary to you, right? If you're like, I couldn't possibly do that, right? Um, because it would make me depressed, right? If we're following that line of thought, like it will make me feel shame or make me feel inferior of some way. I will also offer though the opposite thought that if you do the money date with yourself and you don't like what you see, and you already know kind of going in that it's not going to be a beautiful, you know, a beautiful, rosy picture. Um, that is oftentimes when great ideas are able to pop up that are money making, are generating income or new clients or just opening another door for yourself. I think sometimes when we're up against the reality of what we have to fix, that is when our brain goes, oh, remember that idea we had three years ago that you pushed way in the back? Maybe now's a good time to take action on it. So it's not always going to end. In fact, I think it never ends with you just in a pile of like sadness being like, what do I do? For me, it always ends with, okay, so then my next action should be fill in the blank. It leads you to a point where you need to make a decision and there is real emotion attached to that decision. Like I liken it to standing naked in front of a mirror and not liking my body when I see it, right? Like that's going to make me want to go to the gym. It's going to make me want to make different food choices. Yeah. It might make me want to get a personal trainer to help me with that. So at that point, when you see the picture for what it is, brutally honest, you are then able to make a decision and really feel aligned to it. And that's going to lead to the success that eventually comes because then you're going to remember that image of you standing in front of the mirror and you're going to start consistently going to the gym because you don't want to see that in the mirror, you know, until yeah. it gets better. And you sort of need that inflection point to really then be able to do anything because you can make a decision and then not stick to it and not go to the gym anymore, yeah. not see the trainer, eat terrible food, yeah. but then you're going to find yourself on your next money date or naked date, whatever you do in your life, <laughs> looking at yourself being like, oh my God, I had the opportunity to change and I didn't. Yeah. What the hell am I doing? You get to recommit. And so not only getting financially naked with yourself once, but doing it on an ongoing basis. Put a calendar entry in your calendar every month and have a money date with yourself. Get a little spoonful of sugar, have a glass of champagne or whiskey, whatever your poison is. <laughs> Help the medicine go down and get really honest with yourself often and really check in with yourself. Yeah. And you have a guide about how to do the money date, right? I sure do. I have a freebie that is available on my website www.disruptinginertia.com. You can get my free money date handbook. 
and you can, it's for people who don't like Excel and it takes you through a workbook of getting all your assets together, checking your credit card statements, your bank statements, looking around your house about, you know, kind of what assets do I have that I'm not realizing that I have yeah. and really lets you take a full inventory to then take the next step. I love it. We'll link to that in the show notes. Um, because I, I have done it. I have the workbook, I have the guide and, uh, it was very helpful. I am someone though who checks. I mean, I check my bank account like every single day. Like I'm on top of, I literally am on top of things on the daily. Cause that makes me feel better. That makes me feel a comfort to know exactly to the penny what is happening in every, in every like area of the business. But I know that I'm unusual in that. Cause every time I say it to non-financial people, they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, it's like the first thing I do when I sit down at my desk. <laughs> like, is everything good? Everything's good. We can move on. But speaking of daily. Yeah, work, but you you derive a level of safety and security from checking that too. It is still yeah. in the bank. Okay, phew. Yeah, still yeah. Still got my cash there. And honestly, that comes from my past of putting the blinders on and not really wanting to know, right? And figuring out that like, that's not healthy for me. Like I need a better habit around money and how I'm dealing with money. And, you know, to be honest, on a practical level, I have caught several errors from other, from like hotels I've stayed at, you know, like double charges. Like I'm, all of my friends will tell you, like, I'm the person. In fact, I was talking to my publicist a couple of days ago and she and I had stayed at a hotel in Wisconsin and she said, remember that hotel we stayed at? What was the name of it? And I was like, and I said the name and she goes, how do you remember that? And I goes, I said, because they charged my credit card four times. And she's like, are you serious? I was like, I will never forget the name of that place. It's burned in my brain forever because I had to call them like three times to be like, what are you doing? And she's like, only you would have that as the memory. I'm like, well, that's, they stuck in my brain for, <laughs> for that because I'm- Well, calling- and I'll tell you, that is my hack. We no longer reconcile checkbooks but checking your credit card statements, checking online dashboards, checking your bank platform, that is how you are going to catch fraud yeah. and people duplicate charging four times charging your account. Yep. It is required. This is not a world anymore where you can just ignore your finances. That, no. that will lead to bad things. Yeah. And honestly, once it becomes a daily habit, it's very easy and it doesn't, you don't have that emotional hit of like... I got to check the credit card. You just, it's like, you're just going, okay, are we good? Are we good? Are we good? Okay, moving on. Like it doesn't. That's the consistency. That's the consistency we build with a money date, except you're doing it every day. Great. Yes. Get to that point where it's not charged emotion and you're just like, great, did it next. Yes. Well, that leads me to ask you about your uh, daily habits. So we're really big on talking about self-care here on the show. It's actually my entire membership is about self-development and taking care of yourself in ways that are just not you know, the tasks or daily day-to-day of your business. So Diana, for you, uh, do you have like a, a morning routine or a night routine or and some sort of daily habit that keeps you safe and sane and good? I do. First of all, when I wake up, I like to get up and have coffee for 37 hours uh, <laughs> <laughs> or until I've depleted the coffee pot. Um, but the other thing is that in 2019, pre-COVID, I invested in a hot tub. I didn't have enough money for it. So I had to beg a family member to help me out. And then I put it on a credit card and I invested in a hot tub. And that thing, let me tell you, got me through COVID. Every time I'm stressed out, I go take a soak in the hot tub. I wash away. What did I do before this podcast? I sat in my hot tub in the middle of the day for 15 minutes and just had me time. If I take my phone there, it plays music or it stays on silent. I don't respond to emails. I don't respond to texts and I just relax. That's my me time. That's my self-care. That washes everything away and lets me be the cool person you're talking to right now. Uh, You're the only person who's ever said hot tub. I love it. She has a lifestyle to which she's become a girl. That's right. She's got... (laughs) Good standards, y'all. Oh, I love a hot tub moment. But I, I didn't always have the money for it, and I had to work for it to right. get there. But it is something that has paid back in dividends and appreciation since then. Oh, I love that. Now, that's how I feel about my Peloton. I mean, we had the money for it. It wasn't. A, it didn't feel super stressful. But it is a. It was a payment until we paid it off, and uh, it was also motivating, right? Because every time we make the payment, I'd be like, "Well, I better get on the bike because otherwise, it's just sitting here doing yeah. nothing." So yeah, I have one of those too. I love that thing. That's the other part of my self-care routine is moving my body every day. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, Well, tell everyone where they can find you out on the world wide web, as it were. 
Yes. So you can get all of my freebies, not just the Money Date Handbook, but I have four webinars to help build your financial literacy on disruptinginertia.com. My main website for Fan Your Flame, my coaching business, is fan-your-flame.com. I instead decided to invest my money someplace else rather than a domain name without hyphens. So you get hyphens. And on there, you can find how to work with me. You can find the podcasts I've been on, my money, music, playlist, books about money that I recommend, everything. And you can find me on my Instagram through my website as well. Nice. We're going to link to all of those things in the show notes. You can very easily find Diana out in the world and connect with her and hire her and do your money date with her and leave better for it. Thank you so much for being here, Diana. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure, Renee. Anytime, friend. Anytime. All right, loves. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Bye for now. Bye.